Hello, welcome to the Streamlined Connection. I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino, and we are on the Bold Brave TV network. Um, for those of you that don't know much about the Streamlined Connection yet, it is all about creating that connection between organization and productivity and money mindset and how all of those things can work together to help you feel less stressed. Because organization is really the key to the freedom, the wealth and prosperity. And it's, it causes disorganization when you're stressed and it causes stress when you're disorganized and figuring out the little tools and tricks and how to work with the way our brains work helps us figure out how to keep it all together. Um, and that helps you create that connection between the control you crave, right? You don't want to lose control, but you also want a lot of freedom. And um, to have that freedom, you have to have some systems for productivity and organization. And it's organization is that powerful tool for helping control the external space, which is really just a uh, reflection of that internal space, right? So it's all part of the same puzzle and it's not separate. Whereas a lot of my clients come to me thinking, I just got to get organized. I got to throw some stuff in a box and put a label on it. That's not actually how it works. So we're going to help you um, scale your business, create more nurturing and supportive environment for you to do that. It creates more prosperity and wealth. You can take more vacations. And um, just understanding that simplicity is based in your mind first, and then it trickles out to the other areas. And that's going to make it easier. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino with More Than Organized, and we're here on the Streamlined Connection. And I have been a certified professional organizer and a money breakthrough business coach for over 20 years and have been studying how habits affect productivity and what that does to our mindset around clutter and making money. So now that you know about me, I'm super excited for my guest today. I'm actually a little bit nervous. I, I've known him and I've followed him and I know how fancy he is <laughs> compared to me. And yet I didn't get nervous till I was rereading his bio. So today I've got Mike Vardy. He is also known as the Productivityist. He's a highly acclaimed productivity strategist and creator of the productivity philosophy and framework. Um, it's called time crafting, and I love this concept so much. Um, and great minds, you know, I've cobbled together my own productivity system that has a lot of crossover, not entirely, and that's okay because we like to talk to people with slightly different takes on things because what I have to say might not resonate with you, but what Mike has to say might. And so we're all in this together. Um, he's considered one of the top thought leaders in pro personal productivity and has um, and, and time management, and he's trained hundreds of people over the years to to be able to do that. Um, this is the part that made me nervous. He's featured in all the all the great places: Life Hacker, Life Hacker, Fast Company, Huffington Post. He's interviewed such visionaries as Seth Godin, Brian Tracy, and um, Keith Ferrazzi. And even Gretchen Rubin, um, who I also adore. So there, you know, there's podcasts and then there's podcasts. And his podcast is a productive conversation and it has over 5 million downloads. So I'm super excited that he's gracing us with his presence today, the day after Turkey Day, which he's Canadian, so it didn't matter to him. Um, and anyway, welcome to the show, Mike. I'm so excited you're here. Thanks for having me, Miriam. I'm really, really happy to be here. And and it is, yeah, it's kind of weird. This is the lull for me this weekend mm -hmm. because most of my clients are American. So I get this nice, I get to celebrate Thanksgiving as well. I get this breather, right? <laughs> nice. I love it. <laughs> well, hopefully this is the only thing you've got on your, your plate for today. But um, that's probably not true because you're, you know, productive. Um, <laughs> So I want, I'm really excited. I, I just wanted to share. I have just received my now year planner. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Um, and it's um, going on the wall this weekend because that's what I do on Thanksgiving weekend. I don't go shopping. I go and do my, my planning for 2022. So that's been my ritual for a while. But tell me a little bit about your, is this a new thing? Is this, this is like, you've had the six rules for a, a few years, right? I've had so the the six People rules thought. of product. 
Yeah, yeah. So so the six rules of productivity came like someone asked me, a friend of mine, Chris Ducker, said, I need you to put together a presentation. I need it to be succinct. I need it to be impactful. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned this idea of the six, which is this program that I have, uh, which basically gives you uh, six ways to approach your your day, um, your week, mm -hmm. your month, et cetera. And interestingly, he interpreted that as, oh, so there's six rules to productivity. And when he said that to me, I'm like, well, let me let me sit back and, and, and take a look at this. And and as I as I went through it, I'm like, you know what? When it comes to the work I do, there really are like six core rules that mm -hmm. that I think if you follow any and or all of them, and it's like anything else. This is related to time crafting as well. And you know this, Miriam, mm -hmm. is is the more you layer, the more impact it's gonna have, right? So yes. I think what happens with a lot of people. And I can I've seen this when I've worked with and, and spoke with people in the organizational space as well, is when you try to do too much all at once, the whole house of cards collapse. You get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. The very thing that you're trying to do <laughs> to eliminate rather ends up yeah. getting, you know, accentuated. So I thought about this and I, and I wrote down, you know, kind of the entire time crafting framework and it does break down really to, to six rules. So, um, oh, you know, fantastic. I mean. It, it, that's kind of how it came to me and, and I've been presenting them regularly. And what's great is with most people that I've talked to, uh, again, the more rules they add, the better, but there's always one that they go, Oh, Oh, Oh. And then as, as soon as they get that, all you also mm -hmm. needs is that one spark and it, yeah. and it it gets the fire going. Right. Yeah. It's like Decker telling you there's six rules, right? Like it's, so obvious we don't see it ourselves when we're the creator of it sometimes. Right. It's the it's the yeah. gaps. Right. And that's one of the reasons why I like working with group coaching and stuff as well. Like, I mean, even though I've worked mm. with hundreds of one on one, I've worked with like more than that when it comes to group stuff, because um, you get that feedback from people because you can't see all the all the gaps. And when you're so close to something, mm -hmm. like you said, sometimes you miss out on things. That's also why when you start teaching this stuff, you need to work from that beginner's angle as opposed to, oh, here are all these things I've learned over the 15 years I've been doing this. Right. Yeah, it's so critical. I um, there's a study where they took scientists in different fields and they put them into mastermind groups. And when they would get together and talk amongst themselves and kind of present to each other, they got so much better feedback and so many more breakthroughs because someone from outside their field, but understanding the scientific process could see the the blind spots. And so yeah. it's all, it all is starting to play to how our brains actually process information. And I found, um, we're, we're going to be talking about this a little bit more, but what I found is sometimes there's that one piece that's missing. And once you find that kind of threshold or keystone concept, the rest of it all falls into place and then it all makes sense. Um, so I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino. This is the Streamlined Connection on Bold Brave TV Network. And we will be back after this break to talk more about the six rules of productivity with Mike Vardy. The free one minute mail solution works for email too, and you can download it at the link below or over there. Maybe it's a, the link. And we were just talking about how sometimes something very obvious is just missing from your system or your creative process that allows all the things to fall into place. So what are these six rules of productivity, Mike? So this is where I can come in and fill the gaps because most people, when they hear them, they're like, oh, that that kind of makes sense. So the first rule is to capture everything. So get what? it out of your head. This is not this is not <laughs> an unheard of rule before. But the thing is, is that when you capture everything, you regret nothing. Right. So you yeah. tend to use our uh, our minds as like a storage facility. And, and I've always said your mind was meant to be a factory and not a warehouse. Right. Mm. So. If you if you free your mind up with all of this clutter, because some of it can be cluttered, some of it can be very useful. But the thing is, is use these two these storage tools that we have: computers, tablets, good old fashioned pen and paper. Put those things to use. When you have an idea that comes to mind, get it out of your head, get it in front of you, so you can assess it properly and do a whole bunch of different things with it that you can't do when it's mm -hmm. swirling around up in in your head with a bunch of other things that may be either related or unrelated. 
once you start to get that capture habit down, then you're going to find you're going to be able to be more creative. You're going to be able to be deliver more qualitative work because you're not going to be as focused on what was that thing again? And your brain will leave clues, by the way, Miriam, when when you think that you shouldn't capture something, it's exactly when you should like, oh, I'll remember that later. Get it out of your head. Those oh. kind of things are clues. So if you start this habit of capturing everything, then all of a sudden you can like say, well, that doesn't matter anymore. You get it out of your get it out of your system or the things that do matter, you can illuminate them and give them the attention they deserve. Yeah, about 12 years ago, I came up with the perfect title for my book mm -hmm. right after a nap. I failed to write it down. Uh. Two days later, I went to start outlining. I couldn't remember. And then I was like, ah, now I don't know the title of the book, so I don't know what I'm writing about. <laughs> there, there's this great um, uh, YouTube clip, uh, John Tesh, in concert. Not that I'm a mm -hmm. huge John Tesh music fan, but this sure. is an interesting. Mm -hmm. But he wrote the NBA <laughs> on NBC theme from the 90s. And yeah. he actually, it's called Round Ball Rock. And he, he said, this is what I did to come up with the song. And he has the answering machine tape. He called home because he was mm -hmm. overseas on tour and basically hummed or or kind of mouthed out the the sounds, the song, the the main theme into his phone on the answering machine so that he wouldn't forget it. Now, imagine sports fans out there, if you did not have that iconic NBA theme from the 90s that still gets used. For, he would have I mean, that thing. Yeah. Not only not only it's iconic, but it probably brought him a little bit of cash, too. So you don't. Bit. <laughs> you don't necessarily, yeah, you don't know. So it's better yeah. to get it out of your head. That way you can assess it later. I, I also believe that, you know, the universe has a way of picking back up. Like when it comes back to me is going to be the time I, I sit down and actually write the book that weekend kind of thing. Um, but I think there's something to having it captured. And what you said, the assessment, like you have to be able to discern between the different ideas you have and and the things you need to do to, to prioritize right 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 and, and the thing is yeah. is it, it's not only about capturing it but also making sure that you have a simple way to find it later so for example yeah. um i don't necessarily care what notebook it's in i just need to know what note what kind of notebook i write things down in so i have a very specific type of notebook i don't need right. to remember what i captured i just and that's why i bring a notebook like a little mini notebook and a pen with me in every jacket that i have I don't right. remember what I captured. I just have to ask myself when I get home, did I write something down? Oh, I did. And then I just right. put it in this, believe it or not, this physical inbox that just sits <laughs> on my desk and it, that's where it goes. And then I have a simple way of knowing if I look at the, if I look at the things on my, on my, in these notebooks, if they've got a line through it, it means I did it. If I've got an arrow through it, it means I moved it to my master planner. And when I have a squiggly line through it, it means I'm deleting it. If there's no line through it. I haven't made a decision on it yet. So it's very simple for me to look at the stuff and know what to do with it, as opposed mm -hmm. to just trying to remember what what I might have forgotten. Right. I love that you also have a, a little like capture code so mm -hmm. that, you know, I do too. Um, big fan of those. I think I learned the most of my capture codes through like Daytimer back in the 90s. But <laughs> yep. it's all the same. It's just slightly slight variations on things. Right. Sure. Um, okay, so what's rule number two? Well, rule number two is related to capture. Once you capture it, it's important to look at it and go, is this a task or is this a project? So you have to break it down. So many yeah. people have to-do lists that are not doable because they haven't broken the project down, which they've disguised as a task, into yeah. its smallest particles, right? Like, for example, you mentioned the book, right? Mm -hmm. If you wrote down in your to-do list, work on book, that is a terrible task. Right. <laughs> because your brain, your brain wants to get to completion. So it yeah. looks at it and goes, I can't get that done today, which means I can't get the book finished today. Well, you're not consciously, you're not, you're, not ex you're not expecting that. But the key mm -hmm. is, is that if you were to say, okay, well, let me break this down into its smallest particles, you could have things like uh, come up with, uh, you know, write 500 words, that's one, or get ISBN code for book if you're gonna self, like all these yeah. little things that go into it. Uh, and, and the danger that most people have and the biases that show up when I give this piece of advice and share this rule with them is, is they say, well, now my to-do list is just longer. No, it's just more visible. So you've gotta be mm -hmm. careful with tasks that are on your to-do list that are actually projects. And there's mm -hmm. lots of ways to see this. Like if you see the word and, like any other conjunctions, 
that's more than one task. Like, you know, that's that's right. a project. That's two lines. That's exactly <laughs> right. And and think about this in terms of household stuff. Like doing laundry is a project. It is. It's yeah. legit, right? <clears throat> Driving a car is mm -hmm. a project technically. Like my daughter's learning to drive right now. It's a project. She has to, we now know what to do because thanks to our good old fashioned basil ganglia, we have habitual stuff that knows, oh, we get in the car, we go. Grocery shopping is a project. But if you break those things down, you can actually get those little dopamine hits a lot more, number one, because you're seeing these smaller tasks inside of these projects. But yes. number two, you figure out what to delegate. Like there's things yes. inside that you can delegate. <laughs> so. In essence, you're just getting, all you're doing when you break it down, which is rule number two, is getting a real good landscape of what you actually need and want to do, and then you can make better decisions from that. Yeah, I think that is really important. And and I use the driving analogy all the time. I'm like, if you can get, drive a car, you can get organized. We just have to break down the steps, and then you have to repeat them a few times till you get the habit. Thank you, how our brains work. Aren't you excited <laughs> they're figuring it out finally? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, let's get a little preview of what rule number three is, and then we'll talk about it after the break. Well, I'll tell you that there's only one one thing you can do really quickly to do list that makes it more doable, and it's super oh, yeah. simple. We can do it really quickly. It just takes one word. Uh huh. I'll leave it at that. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> I'm Mary Martizzi Pino. This is the Streamlined Connection on Bold Brave TV Network. And after the break, we're going to find out what that word is. The Streamlined Clutter Solution online course will help you gain control of your stuff and space. What are you waiting for? The links are here somewhere. We're about to find out what the and phrase is, or the, the word is for um, figuring out our to-do lists, it's breaking out the project. Yeah, it's the third rule. So the third okay. rule of productivity takes one word to do it. It's it's called activate your to-do list. So you need yeah. to activate it. That's the third rule. But the word is not activate. The word is a verb. Verb it's it. any verb. As mm -hmm. soon as you put a verb in front of your to-do list, you instantly make it more doable. And the problem is most people don't start their to-do list with verbs. They get so caught up in just writing things down. They're not They're not just detailed enough to say, oh, I need to write report instead of just writing down the name of the report or yeah. imagine writing down the word bill but you have to pay a bill do you have to call yeah. bill do you have to do you have to cancel the bill like I the thing it. is we get so if if we take a beat and it, i do this exercise a lot i think i did this when when i when i spoke at napo a few years ago the 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 60 second break which is we do nothing for 60 seconds that doesn't make for good tv but it makes for great live theater where it's you're sitting there yeah. for 30, 60 seconds no one can do anything and then i say all right uh now how did that feel and most people go oh, i felt amazing it felt boring it felt ang anxious and then mm -hmm. i tell them it was 42 seconds it was 36 seconds like most people don't know how long yeah. a minute actually is if you take even a fraction of that five seconds what's the verb for this and you it means immediately you activate your to-do list. And then what else happens here, Miriam, is you can see the patterns, right? Like the verbs mm -hmm. you're using most common, you can then start to batch those tasks. <gasps> I'm going to go and call, <laughs> and then you're all of a sudden picking up the phone and calling seven people in a row because you're in that modality, right? So yeah. activate your to-do list. Just put verbs in front of it. You instantly make your to-do list more more doable. That's one habit. The first three rules are the simplest of all, and, it, and they are the ones that are going to have the greatest impact right out of the gate for you. Yeah, and um, I just wanted to to share a quick story with everyone about the call thing. So I, most of you know, I'm a little bit politically active, and I'm not going to tell you which side or anything. You can probably guess, but I make calls for candidates a lot during um, campaigns. And I, last time I called, I grabbed a list. They they tend to give you a list of people to call, and they say, okay, come, you know take your cell phone, go make the calls, bring it back. And I asked for a second list and they're like, oh no, that should be plenty. And I'm like, no, give me another one. I'm not driving back to, to do just, you know, 45 names or whatever was on it. I came back in 90 minutes and I had finished two lists and no one else who was there calling finished even the first one because they didn't know how to batch. Like yep. they didn't realize you just plug in the phone, you dial, you hang up, you dial, you hang up, you dial, you hang up and you get through a whole bunch of calls. So batching is fantastic. Um, all right, so we've got 
What do we have so far? Capture. Yep. Mm-hmm. And we have Break it down. Break it, break it down. It. And we've got verbit. Yep. And what is number four? Fourth rule is to align your calendar and your to-do list. Most people don't use both in mm -hmm. tandem. Either yeah. you put all your tasks on your calendar, and the problem with that is that the calendar is a very specific frame. And mm -hmm. if you get too detail oriented on a task or on your calendar rather with a task and you don't get to it or something happens, then all of a sudden you have no place to put it because you've you've got your calendar so filled with tasks. Plus, yeah, um, a time based mindset revolves around things like I need to be at the dentist at a certain time. I need to be on an interview at a certain time. What mm -hmm. happens inside of those are going to be the details around it. I like to think of the calendar as kind of the directory of your days mm -hmm. and the to-do like list. Yeah. yeah. And, and the to-do list is the details, right? The to-do list is the details of your days. So mm -hmm. when you use them together, so for example, uh, let's say today, and, and I'll, this is where I get into time crafting a little bit. Today is my maintenance day, right? Because it's a low energy kind of day. So Fridays are my maintenance day. Well, I then can look at my to-do list and see what are the maintenance tasks that I have on my to-do list. So I yeah. use them together. And what's great is you could still be a really big calendar person and just have a very small to-do list, but they're talking to each other. When they talk to each other, you're able to switch between a task-based mindset, which allows you to focus on what's important, and a time-based mindset, which often forces you to deal with what's urgent, right? So yeah. having those things work together um, is is the best way to be productive. Having just one working on its own without the other, you're going to find some gaps that show up. Yeah, and I think I love the way you describe it because, you know, these concepts have been around for a while, but they haven't really, it's the connection piece that hasn't mm -hmm. always been clear. It's like, here's a tool, here's a tool, here's a tool, but not how they interact and how they support and um, help each other. So I love that you've pulled that together into the concept. Um, and I, when I figured out the trick to batching and, or time blocking or time crafting, whatever you want to call it, where you're using the, the framework that is a calendar to, and then the, the tool that is the to-do list to capture the details, it changed my life. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and that's yeah. the thing is that is that it creates it's simple, it's flexible, it's durable and it's sustainable when you start to do these things. And it's and yeah. the thing is, we get so outcome focused, which I think is an, it's not a huge problem. But the big problem is, is that we I hate to break it to everybody, but you're going to have a to do list that's going to have things that will never get done on it. It's just I mean, we yeah. own, you know, and once you are OK with that, then you figure out what to do with those things on it that you do want to get done. And, and I've often mm -hmm. said that productivity isn't about efficiency and effectiveness. Those are byproducts. Productivity mm -hmm. is the uh, basically the active linking between your intentions and your attention. And the, yeah. the closer that link, the narrower the productivity gap, the further away, the larger the gap. So if you can say, what do I intend to do? Oh, I intend to do this. Okay, how am I going to pay attention to it? You get that really going, you're gonna be in great shape. And that's what the calendar and to-do list can let you do. Exactly. It is, um, it's the way our brains work now, people. We understand it. <laughs> <laughs> you have to pay attention to your intentions so that you can practice it. And then it, much of it can become a habit, but some mm -hmm. of it can just become creative tension and um, that motivates you to finish a project. So um, cool. What, um, what, what do we think about, um, what what happens after we align our calendars and our to do things, and then we're well, gonna have to take a break. Well, there's two two more, and you actually alluded to it a little bit with regards to habits. Rule five, which we'll get to in a, in a minute, has a lot to do with habits and how they can help you build boundaries and get to the things you really need and want to do. Excellent. This is Miriam Ortiz Pino on the Streamlined Connection. I'm talking with Mike Vardy, the productivityist, about the six rules of productivity today, and we're having some mind blowing connections about how time works with our brains. So we'll be right back. Get the Streamlined Paper Solution online course and learn quick ways to control interesting information. The link's here. And we're just about to get into habits. Why are habits important? What do we use them for? Well, rule number five 
is the basic ability to stack habits. And when you stack them, you create certainty. And in a world that is far from certain at the best of times, um, it's important to follow this rule, which is to build routines. And what routines are, are essentially just a series of habits stacked one upon each other. So you talked about the idea of batching tasks, which is what the third rule allows you to do with the activating your to-do list. The verbs help you batch. Well, when you have routines in certain spaces, it creates certainty in your schedule, whether it's your day, your week, your month, whatever. And that's mm -hmm. why I'm a big believer in having at least two routines in your day, your evening yes. routine and your morning routine. The key mm -hmm. is you need both. They are the bookends to your day. Think of routines, especially the morning and evening routine, as the edge pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. When your day is the jigsaw mm -hmm. puzzle, having those routines there are exactly what you need to solve the rest of the puzzle, to deal with what all the uncertainty that's in the center. There's nothing, uh, whenever you're making a jigsaw puzzle, you always start with those edge pieces because it creates the frame. And then you'll deal with the middle part. And I, I often joke, when you open a jigsaw puzzle, the, if you find a bunch of pieces clustered together that that are part of the, you're like, should I should I break these apart or should I keep them? That's kind of like your day too. Like, yeah. oh, there's a definite part of my day that I know I want to be this way. I'm going to leave this this way. So I think that having um, consistent and again, simple, durable, sustainable routines, so portable ones. Don't make a routine with a habit that you may have to change radically. Like for example, instead of saying go to the gym every morning, well, what if you're traveling? What if there's mm -hmm. no gym available? Instead saying work out in the morning. And then all of a sudden you basically have a way to work out whether you're on the road or at home. So try to make those routines portable. And then I, the evening routine works for both night owls like me and morning people because it allows you to close out the day strong, but get a head start on the next day. So I have three steps, mm -hmm. three habits that are at the end of each, uh, that are part of each routine. I think you put those in place it makes the day that much more palatable yeah i think i think i learned this from you the like i i knew about habit stacking when you're trying to get a new habit but i didn't realize about the book ending and how how much that can help you feel productive at the end of the day and it creates that feedback loop so there's like the preparation there's the actions and then there's the review at the end of the day and it's it felt weird at first to be that structured first and last thing, even though I already had, you know, my morning coffee, workout, brush my teeth routine. <laughs> it, 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 it's <laughs> it's like, what? I could do it for work too? What? <laughs> it, it's funny, Miriam, because most people, when we talk about this stuff, they're already doing it. We're just mm -hmm. giving it like life in form of a label or definition. We're defining it, right? So when yeah. some people say like uh, an evening routine, I don't have one. And I go, what do you do before you go to bed? And they list off the four things or when they finish work, I'm like, you have mm -hmm. a routine. You just need to yeah. own it. And interestingly, morning routines are often dense, right? They're like, because mm -hmm. we're often headed off to work and we've got kids or whatever, but evening yeah. routines are often distributed, right? Like the end of mm -hmm. work routine. So they're not necessarily as clustered because we have more agency over our time in the evening. So right. if you think about an evening routine as distributed, as opposed to a morning routine, which is dense, it gives you that awareness that, oh, I do have an evening routine. And then you can start to make sure that you give it the attention that it deserves. I love that. And I, I think it helps people sleep better, too, because you have defined that for your brain, your unconscious brain, that it is now winding down and getting ready for sleeping. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. It all works together. All right. What is... Um, Number, what are we on? Are we on? We're five? on the last one. Wow. Oh, we're on six already. Oh. We're on. We're on the sixth. Good thing we have a lot more to talk about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the sixth rule of productivity has to go back to that definition of productivity that I've talked about, which is intention and attention. Mm -hmm. You need to champion your intentions. That is the sixth rule because you could follow all of these with other people's demands, the things that come in via email, the things that come from your family the things that are assigned to you in a project management tool that you're forced to use at the job or Slack mm -hmm. or both. But if you don't find a way to give attention to your intentions and champion those, mm -hmm. then you're not going to feel like you've accomplished the things that you really needed and wanted to do. You're not going to feel fulfilled. You won't have that sense of relief. Instead, you'll have that sense of overwhelm. So the way you do this is to create realistic boundaries and expectations for yourself. I don't like 
the number three, three big rocks. You probably heard that term before when it yeah. comes to like, these are my three big rocks for the day. Cause often it goes back to rule number two, which is they haven't broken the, the thing down. So it's like, yeah. I'm going to work on my book. That's a big rock. Well, no, it's, it's actually 43 rocks. And now all of a sudden you can't get them done. Um, yeah. The other thing is sometimes we cheat it. And so we actually aren't honest and say that these three big rocks are actually little tiny ones. Like I have to send this email and oh good, I got oh, that. I know. Yeah. <laughs> right? Oh my God, I was so busy today and people list these things. I'm like, well, that would have taken me 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and it, it, it's nuanced, right? Uh, again, yeah. what's interesting is productivity is very subjective, right? Like most mm -hmm. people don't think it's objective. When you're working on a project, a project is objective, but the way we mm -hmm. approach it is subjective. So three, yeah. three big rocks I have a problem with because unless you know exactly how to follow those other rules, it, it becomes challenging. And then there's 10, like the number, I'm going to get 10 things done today. Good luck on getting 10 of your things, not anything. You can get right. everybody else's stuff, but 10 of your things, highly it's unlikely. Many. It's too many. I like the number six. I really mm -hmm. do like that number six. It falls nicely in between. It it allows you, and, and what I love about it is, and I actually put this in my program called the six, we use a hexagon. So we actually have a hexagon shape mm -hmm. and I actually have these little cards now that I'm putting together that just say, if I can close the hexagon by the end of the day, I just have this little hexagon. I'm like, oh, did I do this? If I can close the hexagon, I had a productive day. I got, I championed my own intentions. And you could do this with, um, you know, a, a bullet journal, whatever you want to do. But the reason that the hexagon is so um, appealing to me is first off, it's six sides. So it hits all those notes. It's a natural shape. Nature loves mm. hexagons. Yes. It's also the strongest shape with the most density. So those angles that they have, the 120 degree angles, that's used in like airplanes. Like mm -hmm. the, the wings, it's, it's that kind of metal design because it's flexible, but it's also durable. And the yes. other, and finally, the, the last piece is that it's the, the one that can fit across a plane without any gaps. Triangles can do this, squares can do this, but they don't have as many touch points. Hexagons mm -hmm. can. So I love the number six. And I think if you use that to champion your intentions, you're gonna be in a much more productive place. Yeah. Oh, this is interesting. I may have to try six. I tend to do three, but not the three big rocks. I do the three most important things. Um, but then I also probably do three of my routine things like the maintenance things. Um, anyway, we'll talk more about this after the break. I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino with the Streamlined Connection on Bold Brave TV Network, and we'll be right back. Get the Streamlined Paper Solution online course and learn quick ways to control interesting information. The link's here. And I'm having a fabulous time. I hope you guys are too. Um, it is all about wrapping it up what the with the six things let's re just review them real quick sure so the six rules of productivity are as follows capture everything number two is to break it down so make sure you're breaking your projects down into the smallest particles that you need them to be broken down to number three is uh activate your to-do list so put a verb in front of every task on your list so that way you know what to do and you can batch those tasks as far easier number number four is align your calendar and your to-do list. So don't let one rule over the other, make them work together like a really happy partnership. Number five is to build routines, specifically evening and morning routines, because they can create a really nice shape for your day and create certainty in days that are all but that. And then finally, champion your intentions. So make sure that you illuminate what you wanna work on so that you can eliminate some of the things you don't, and also don't end up focusing just on the external demands of others. So. Yes, that's a big deal. That's that's why we and if you follow those five rules, it's far easier. The first five, it's far mm -hmm. easier to do the sixth. It's far easier. Well, you automatically eliminate a bunch of the time that you would be available for some of those other things like it. Exactly. You just and you don't feel like you have the free time in the same way. Like it changes the actual emotion and, and relationship with time when you start doing that. Exactly. And, and you even pointed out like the idea of um, you know, habits, routine, routines, that could be one of your six things. Like if you're really trying, trying to build a habit, mm -hmm. one of your six things could be, I need to meditate every day. So if yes. you get that, done, that's one of your intentions. The intentions don't have to be these massive, massive, impactful things out of the gate. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been meditating as of right now, I've done 32 straight days of meditation as of, as of, you know, today. 
And mm -hmm. I'm already noticing that not only is it changed me in a lot of ways, I'm thinking a lot clearer, but now if I don't do it, I feel weird. So I don't yeah. know that I, I, so I don't need to necessarily put it on my list because it's become habitual. But when you're trying to establish a habit, that's one of those six intentions that you can mm. highlight and illuminate. So that way you can actually, you know, it, it takes time, it compounds. And by the way, if the one thing about meditation that drives me nuts is people, they're like, oh, I'm not very good at it. It's not about getting good at it. It's about being consistent. with. You don't win mm -hmm. meditation. It's called a practice for a reason. There's no game. It's just right. you do it, right? Yeah, it's not even about clearing your mind, people. You can do creative visualization meditations where you're actually writing a story in your head. You you can find a way that makes it work, but it's about gaining clarity in your, in your mind and, and focus in your day. So I highly recommend it as well. Um, something we were talking about during the break that I wanted to bring back up just because it, I think it will really help people is re revisiting the verbs on the to-do list. We mm -hmm. were talking about when you just say work on, it's too vague Yeah. and we don't have play on, which <laughs> it never even occurred to me. <laughs> well, well, what's, what's interesting, Miriam, is that work, you're right. It's so ambiguous. And I, mm -hmm. and when you're coming up with things that you want to again, illuminate your intentions. So you want to make sure you can pay attention to them. It's not just about putting them in a tool and hoping the tool does the job for you. There are so yeah. many tools out there and it's garbage in garbage out. Right? So, uh, the key is, is to figure out what your just right is. And that comes to, when it comes to verbs, when it comes to the thing I talk about, which is time theming. I also talk about mode based living when it comes to time crafting. But if we we would just want to talk about verbs, well, work on is what I would say. It's too soft. This is called the Goldilocks factor. So it's like, what does work on mean? You're gonna see so many things on your list, you can't filter out the noise. But you might not wanna say like, you know, I'm going to uh, transcribe, because transcribe, you might only have one verb, one one instance of that. So that's what I would say is too hard, it's too narrow. You're gonna do it and then your brain's gonna go, okay, I did it, now what? And then mm -hmm. it's gonna go all over the place again. You wanna find your just right. So maybe instead of work on report, it could be right. Oh, well, I have to write a report, I have to write an email, I have to write this other thing or research. Oh, mm -hmm. I have to research this after. And by the way, reading for you might be different than research. So reading could be pleasure reading. And when it comes to the, the idea of those, those activities, which is really what they are, um, play is one of those, like play with, um, you know, the, the mm -hmm. data that I found about this thing, that's going to create a different emotion inside of you versus work on work can feel like drudgery, especially if you've got 15 things that say work on, but if you've got one that says play with like, Oh yeah, let me play with this data. Let me play with this word that I've come up with this theory. So mm -hmm. figure out what verbs are going to incite action and inspire you, but also that are not so few that you can't find that just right so that you can't batch them. Right? Yeah. I love that. It also, it, it plays so much into crafting and creating our own days and our own reality and what our own sense of pre productivity is. Like it's very creative when you guys start thinking about the words that are going to mean something to you. I'm a huge fan of wordplay and, you know, little things like changing the word from, I used to have call past clients mm -hmm. was one of mine. And then I switched it to connect with old clients or outreach new clients potential clients instead of call them like it still calls and it happens during my call block, but it makes me feel um, more connected to it and it puts a different energy in it than oh, I got to call them. <laughs> well, well the, the other thing it does is that it creates some persona between those. So you could have mm -hmm. call, which could be for people that you've never talked to before, but connect. Those mm -hmm. are the people you have relationships with. So exactly. it's OK to have the same kind of verb for that means the same thing you know, mm -hmm. in a dictionary sense, but to you, if it means something different, that's going to carry you that much further. And it's not so much about quantitative productivity all the time. And I think that's where cor corporate organizational culture, culture loves quantitative because it's easy to measure. Yeah. Qualitative yeah. is much harder, but you can, you can integrate those. There's a harmony. Mm. And that's one of the ways to say connect versus call. That's qualitative. That's like, I'm going to get better results when I connect with these people than if I just simply call them. Yeah, it also plays on, um, you know, our brain's desire to have some sort of challenge and juicy desired outcome um, and how to make that the motivation factor for getting the work done. 
Uh, or, absolutely. Yeah. At the end of the, at the end of the day, we just want to get more of the right things done. You do that, you're going to have a much better day, week, month, and beyond. Exactly. Well, we're almost at wrap up time, but we've got to take one more quick break. And I'm Miriam Ortiz Pino on the Streamlined Connection here on Bold Brave TV Network, and I'm talking with Mike Fardy, the Productivityist, about productivity and the six things that can really help you craft your day. So we'll be right back. Get the Streamline Time Solution online course and learn easy ways to control your time and tasks. Link's here somewhere, down there I think. And we were just starting to get into how to make your days more fun um, and balance some fun and work. So tell me, Mike, what do you actually think about life-work balance? Is there such a thing? So I think that the problem with work-life balance as it's been kind of co-opted is that people seem to think that it's ongoing. It's yeah. something that happens on a sustainable basis. And it's and static. It's not. static. It is not. Balance by its very nature is dynamic equilibrium. Like it's not. Mm -hmm. it, so think about it this way. And I mean, I'm a, I'm a, a, a again, I'll, I'll, I'll peek behind the curtain. I'm a bit of a pro wrestling fan. So I will watch guys balance on the top turnbuckle. They can't stay there all day. People cannot balance on what, try to balance on one leg and see how long you can do it. The more you do it, the better you get at it. But there's no way you could stay like that all day. So I think right. work-life balance isn't about the, the balance itself. It's what you do within the moments of balance. That's yes. the key. So whether And how you recover and right. adjust. Yeah. Right. So that's what that is. So when people are striving for, like, I want balance, um, you will, believe it or not, you will get balance at points during your day, whether you want it or not. It's just going to show up. It's what happens in those moments. And I say moments and not minutes because a moment versus a minute is very different, right? Like a minute mm -hmm. is, is quant is quantitative. It's 60 seconds. A moment you could, I mean, you could argue that we are in a particular moment in time in history right now, right? So a moment can stretch. Mm -hmm. So to me, yeah. it's not work-life balance. Isn't about the balance itself and how the consistency of it, it's more about what you do in those moments where you where you feel it and you go, okay, now what? How do I, how do I, what do I do with this moment right now? Yeah, I love that. It's, it's definitely moment to moment. Um, well, thank you so much, Mike. Um, tell us how we can find you. How can uh, the people watching find you and, and dive into your stuff? Cause it's great, you guys. All so of it. if you, if you want to keep up with me, uh, go to productivityist.com. I have a free ebook there called The Gift of Time, which is telling considering the time of year we're at. So you can get that ebook for free. <laughs> Just have to sign up and get it. And uh, that's I'm productivityist all over the internet. So you can find me there on social media, everything else like that. But productivityist.com uh, and sign up for my free ebook. And, and hopefully it'll be helpful to you. I hope this was helpful to you as well. I th I think it was. Well, it was for me. Hopefully it was for my audience as well. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, for those of you that don't know, I've actually met Mike and, and been to several of his in-person workshops and, um, it's fantastic to, to have him on the show today. Um, I want you all to remember as well that all of the things we talk about connect with both your life and your work and this concept of balance. I like to think of it as leverage. Like what can I do at work that makes me happy? and supports my life on a, on a different level. So it's the same concept explained a couple different ways. So take what resonates for you. Don't forget, you can always reach out and send um, comments, questions, or feedback to Miriam at morethanorganized.net. And next week, we're going to be talking to Robin Reynolds of Organize to Harmonize, one of my good NAPO friends. Um, and Tell all your friends, because doing this organizing and productivity stuff is actually kind of more fun when you have people involved. It can help keep you ac accountable when you're developing new habits as well. You can visit morethanorganized.net to um, find all my stuff, the blog, the resources, how you can work with me. And in the meantime, have a delightful day.